In this week's video, we're going to take a look at floating static routes. Hi, my name is Kevin Wallace and I want to welcome you back to the channel. And we're going to see in this video a use case for a floating static route and a floating static route, that's a route that is not always active. It can sort of act as a standby route in case a primary route learned by a dynamic routing protocol were to go away for some reason. We'll check out an example where we might benefit from using a floating static route, and then we'll take a look at the configuration, and of course we'll verify to make sure everything is working. By the way, this video was taken from a course that I currently have in development. It's my updated CCNA 200-301 video training series. Currently it's in pre-release, it's over 50% done at the time of this recording, and if you want to access it early, the only way to do that is to be part of our All Access Pass. And the All Access Pass, as the name implies, gives you access to all of our current on-demand training, which is over 30 courses at the moment, including the pre-release version of this updated CCNA course. And if you'd like to get access to all this training, go check out kwtrain.com slash all hyphen access. Again, that's kwtrain.com slash all hyphen access. Now let's get into this week's video where we're gonna take a look at floating static routes. In this video, we want to take a look at the configuration of a floating static route. And floating implies that that route is not always active. It's standing by in case a primary routing source were to fail. For example, in this topology, I'm running OSPF on routers R1, R2, and the IP WAN router. And the way that PC1 currently gets to that remote site, BR1, and specifically to the server at that remote site with an IP address of 192.0.2.100. The way PC1 gets there currently is to go from R1 to R2 to the IP WAN and then out to the server. And before we do anything, let's confirm that. Let's take a look at the IP routing table on router R1. Do we know how to get to 192.0.2.0? We do. There's our entry. It was learned via OSPF with an administrative distance of 110, and we're going to get there via 10.0.0.2. That's R2. If I go to our PC and do a trace route to 192.0.2.100, we should see that our first hop is the ingress interface on router R1, 172.16.1.1, and it is. Then we're going to go into gig 0 slash 0 on R2 at 10.0.0.2. Then we go into the IP WAN router, which has an IP address of 198.51.100.1. And finally, we're going to reach our server. That's the path that we're currently going from PC1 to R1 to R2 to the IP WAN router and then out to the server. But let's set up a floating static route on R1 such that if we did have a failure of that link between R1 and R2, the traffic is still going to get through. Here's how we do that. Let's go into global configuration mode and I'll say IP route and I want to educate this router how to get to 192.0.2.0 with a 24-bit subnet mask, we're going to go via a next hop of 10.0.0.6. That's R3. And I'm not going to stop there. Let me give some context-sensitive help. Notice that I can specify a distance metric. This is the administrative distance. I can make this static route, which has a default administrative distance of a 1, I can make it less authoritative than OSPF. Specifically, I can give it a higher administrative distance as compared to 110, and I'm going to enter 150. And I've entered that static route, and if I take a look at my IP routing table now, we will not see that static route. And the reason is, the IP routing table has a more believable source, and that's OSPF with an AD of 110. Now let's simulate a link failure between R1 and R2. Let's go into Global Configuration Mode and then to interface gig 0 slash 1, that points up to R2, and I'm going to shut this down. Let's do a shutdown. So we've uh, simulated a link failure, and the question is, can PC1 still get to server 1, this time going via R3 using that static route? Well, let's take a look at our routing table now. Let's do a show IP route command. And this time, we see that we have a static entry showing up, for 192.0.2.0 slash 24, it has an AD or an administrative distance of 150, and it says we're going to go via 10.0.0.6. That's R3. Let's see if this works. Let's go to PC1, and let's once again do our trace route and see if that second hop now is R3 instead of R2. 
And by the way, I've already gone into the R3 and the IP WAN routers and told them how to get back to 172.16.1.0. So we do have a return path. And it looks like our trace route was successful. Our second hop is 10.0.0.6. That's R3. And that's all due to this floating static route that we configured to be less believable than OSPF, but we saw it kick in and take over when OSPF no longer had a route to that network. 